I'm, I'm really glad there's a mic because this is possibly the longest narrowest room I've ever spoken in. And I was just like, if I didn't have a mic, I mean, I can project, but I don't know if I can really project that much. So this is just the lightsaber. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm the first one. You're going to have to do that again. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Jeff. Wherever, oh, thank you, Jeff, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm really excited, <coughs> and I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm a software engineer at a little consultancy based in Portland called Tilda. And at Tilda, I presumably, for the most, most of the time, I work on a product called Skylight. Um, that's my predominant. That's where I spend 40 hours a week, basically. Um, and Skylight, if you are not familiar with it, is your favorite Rails profiler. Um, and if you haven't heard of Skylight, that's all right. You might have heard of some other things that we're involved with, namely some of these languages and frameworks. So Ember is a front-end framework that Tilda actually, it was actually created at Tilda, um, and we use Ember in our product in Skylight. We also use Rails and Ruby and Rust. And there's one little logo that I left out for Java. It's all right. I, I don't want to scare anybody, but we also use Java. Um, <laughs> um, and we're also heavily involved in the open source aspect of all of these um, projects as well. So you might actually recognize some of my coworkers from the core teams of Rails and Rust and obviously Ember. So if any of these technologies sound interesting to you, quick plug. Um, we are actually hiring, so if you're interested in solving very technical but fun problems, if you're a performance-minded person, if you want to move to Portland, come talk to me afterwards. But when I'm not working on Skylight, I spend a good chunk of my personal time doing something else, learning new things. And a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to learn something very big uh, and something kind of scary. Um, I decided that I wanted to learn computer science. And I decided that I was going to teach myself the fundamentals of computer science. So I created a project called Base CS, which is the basics of computer science. Um, and it was kind of a scary undertaking because at the time I didn't have a computer science degree, and actually I still don't have a computer science degree. So I didn't even know where to begin. Computer science is a huge field, and if someone who doesn't have someone leading you through it, you're kind of like, you know, the blind leading the blind, where you are the person leading yourself. It's very confusing. Um, so I decided to just pick a simple goal in order to start, because you have to start somewhere. I decided that I was going to learn one computer science topic every single week and write a blog post about it for an entire year. Which, if you do some math, that's 52 topics and blog posts. And I actually did do it. And yes, it was a very long year. Um, and sometimes it was really fun. Um, as I started learning about things on my own, it was pretty cool to finally put concepts together with terms and all this jargon that I had heard. And, really get to the point where I wasn't just like nodding at someone talking about, you know, red black trees. I was like, oh, I know what this is now. And it was like, imagine the light bulb emoji right here next to my head. Um, so it was fun and it was very empowering and liberating. But to be completely honest with all of you, a lot of the time it was really, really hard. And as the year went on and the topics that I wanted to learn about got progressively more complex, it was harder to find approachable resources that really would help me understand something when I was learning it on my own. So here's a tweet from one afternoon uh, when I was trying to learn about a concept called ray mixed trees. You can kind of tell that I felt very helpless. And if you're unfamiliar with the owl meme that I'm referencing here, this is what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's some steps missing, like there's got to be like a 1A or a 1B or 1C or something, but nope, conveniently left that out. But this is what learning computer science kind of
kind of felt to me throughout the year. I didn't always voice it, but that there was like this internal struggle of trying to make sense of things that didn't really seem to cater to where I was coming from, where I was in terms of my skill level. And perhaps this meme and that sentiment kind of resonates with you in your own learning journey, whether it's computer science or really anything else. And I think the most frustrating part about the whole thing was that I would find resources that I felt like I should have been able to make sense of, but once I actually started unpacking them, it was clear that one pass or two passes through it weren't really, it wasn't really gonna help me. I would try to read academic papers or um, watch lecture videos and find myself like really struggling to understand something that I knew I could eventually get but was having a hard time because the resource was really limited. And to be honest, the whole thing was a little bit disheartening. But despite feeling pretty hopeless and you know not encouraged by the whole thing, I still kept going. And the reason was that I knew that if I felt this way, there had to be at least one other person out there who also felt just as helpless as I did. And I wanted to make it easier for them. So that was kind of a motivating factor. I didn't want anyone else to have to go through this whole process of trying to find resources and then feel really sad when they couldn't understand them. So I pushed myself to just keep going, if only to help one, one, one other person who was in the same position as me somewhere in the world. And sometimes this meant a lot of late nights for me and even a few tears. But eventually, I got through every CS topic that I set out to learn every week, including radix trees, which coincidentally was the hardest topic for me for some reason. So after the end of the year, I decided to, to turn the base CS written project into an audio format. And I currently am still working on this podcast, um, the base CS podcast, which I host with my really good friend, Saran. You should check it out if you haven't and you can come find me for a sticker that looks like this later, if you'd like. Um, and from the Base Yes podcast, I also branched out to create a video series by the same name created with the team at Dev2. And with each new project and each new medium that I explored, I started to realize that there was a pretty big audience and demand for these kinds of resources. And that kind of made me feel amazing because I was just hoping one other person out there felt the same way that I did, but it turns out a lot of other people did too. And there was such a high interest for approachable computer science resources. And this made me realize throughout this whole struggle that when I was trying to teach myself computer science and when I felt very alone, that was actually part of a much larger problem. It wasn't just me. There were other people who wanted to learn computer science fundamentals, but they were also finding it really hard to find approachable resources. So one of the things that I realized along the way was that learning new things is hard. Actually, correction, it is extremely hard. And if you've ever had to teach yourself something, which I'm sure everyone in this room has at some point, then you know this to be true. And when I was working on base CS, and working on these different versions of it, I started wondering if this is such a large problem. Someone else must have taught themselves this before too. So how did they solve this? How did they learn new things? How did other people learn any new thing in general? What was the process like for that? Was there a good technique? Or were people just kind of like grasping in the dark to understand concepts that were completely foreign to them? So I set out to try to answer this question, and not just because I wanted to get better at my own learning, but also because I really wanted to understand this on a broader level. And the reason was that I really wanted to make the best resources for the most people. So I did some research. Actually, I did a lot of research. I read a lot of papers on psychology and science and the history of learning, and along the way, I stumbled upon the work of this guy. You might recognize him. And if you don't recognize him, you might have heard of him. 
His name is Richard Feynman. So he was an American theoretical physicist who actually created the field of quantum electrodynamics. So a lot of words. Um, and you might know him from his work on helping develop the atomic bomb, and I don't know, maybe that Nobel Prize he won once. Um, but he's also the person who's responsible for figuring out what went wrong with the NASA, um, the NASA Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. So he's done a lot of interesting things that have had a lot of impact. Um, so you've probably interacted with some of his work at some point. But aside from all those things, I found out that he was also an author, a philosopher, an amateur artist, a lock picker, and my favorite, a bongo player. <laughs> because of course. <laughs> I mean, talk about learning new things. If you spend some time learning about Feynman and his extraordinary life, you see that he actually accomplished so many things during his 70, 70 years on this earth. But one of the things I think that is a thread across all of his achievements, whether professional or personal, it's not physics or science or math, really. It was his desire to learn and understand things. Richard Feynman had a nickname. He was often called the Great Explainer. And he got this nickname from his fellow colleagues and, and students. And the reason he, the reason this nickname kind of stuck was that he had a unique way of explaining concepts and teaching and communicating new ideas. And yes, he made like a lasting impact and won a Nobel Prize, but I think it was his work as a teacher and explainer that arguably left a far greater impact on the world than anything else. He had such a great reputation for being a great explainer that um, when he was a grad student at Princeton, Albert Einstein, who was toward the end of his life at the time, actually attended his first lecture at Princeton because he heard about this guy and his reputation. And after, um, many years after he was a graduate student, um, when he was actually teaching, he created some lectures that were recorded. And many years later, Bill Gates watched those recordings of those lectures. And Bill Gates referred to him as the best teacher I never had. And in fact, he was so inspired by these lectures that he, you know, towards later on in his career, uh, he actually found funding to be able to open source all these lectures. And you can still watch them online today. It's pretty cool. So all of my reading on Feynman led me to wonder, how did he become such a great explainer? It's interesting to think about how people learn new things, but he was also a great teacher. So how did he learn new things before he taught them to other people? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to go back in time to Feynman's tenure as a graduate student at Princeton. So during his second year, he was preparing for something called his oral exams, which all the students had to take. And most of the other students were just looking at textbooks and kind of rote memorizing and trying to cram things because they really wanted to pass these exams. Feynman did not do that. Rather than memorizing formulas or poring over textbooks, he did something different. He bought a blank, fresh notebook. And then on the top of the notebook, he wrote this. Notebook of things I don't know about. At least he's like honest and concise, I guess. So in this notebook, he wrote down the things that he didn't understand, the things he understood partly, things he understood very little about. And once he kind of outlined all the topics and his understanding of them, he set to work. James Gleick wrote a biography on Feynman called Genius. And in that biography, he describes Feynman's process um, of going through this notebook pretty well. He says that in his notebook of things to learn, Feynman tried to find the essential kernels of every subject. Ironically, however, his notebook technique wasn't super impactful. I mean, it was good, but it wasn't perfect, because he didn't ace his oral examination. He actually got one question wrong. Um, but at the 
the end of each of these intense learning sessions, he had this notebook filled with things that he had learned along the way. And if you started at the beginning, you saw all the things that he knew very little about. And as he worked through each of these topics, you saw his knowledge and his rapport begin to grow and blossom. And by the end of each of these intense notebook study sessions, he had empirical evidence for how far he had come in his own learning. So you might be wondering, that's all fine, but none of us are like Nobel winning physicists, unless you are, in which case, wow, that's cool. But I'm not. <laughs> but I do actually think it's pretty interesting because we all have things that we want to learn. We all have things we want to learn more about, and we each learn in different ways. So even though our topics might not be the same as Feynman, what would happen if we used his same approach to our own learnings? Even if we don't end up playing the bongos or picking locks like he did, there is still something we can learn from Feynman. We can learn how to learn. Throughout the course of his life, Feynman developed this technique that he really honed and started using for all sorts of topics. So it started in grad school, but he continued it throughout the course of his life. And these days, psychologists and educators and scientists refer to this technique, um, they refer to it as a mental model of the Feynman technique. And it, it's actually surprisingly simple. It's derived directly from his time at Princeton. And if you think about it, it makes sense how his empty notebook technique turned into this. So, what is the Feynman technique? Great question. First of all, don't be worried, it's not too hard, it's only four steps. So let's walk through those steps together. First and foremost, we have to understand and identify what on earth it is that we're learning about. We have to identify the subject of our learning. We have to understand what is the topic that we're trying to pick apart, that we're trying to learn about, before we can go about studying it further. And the best way to do this is to write down everything we know about the topic. It's great if it's in a fresh blank notebook, but it doesn't even have to be. The more that we learn about a topic, we can add to our repository of knowledge. And by having it written down, you can always reference it, and we have that same empirical evidence that Feynman had when he was a grad student. So once we've identified the topic, we're on to step two, explaining it to someone who knows nothing about it. Notice that I haven't said that we should learn new things. All we're trying to do is explain our pre-existing knowledge. And the reason that we should try to explain it to someone who knows nothing, like for our best results, try a child. Um, explaining something, explaining a topic as though the person you're talking to would know nothing about it is actually a really good tool for our own learning. It might seem strange at first, but the reason behind this is because it forces you to speak in plain and simple terms. Take a second and think about how you would explain a web request, or caching, or distributed systems to five-year-olds. What words would you use? What words could you use, and what words could you not use? The interesting thing about this is that Feynman realized that children aren't likely to understand jargon and complex ter terminology. And as adults, we tend to lean on that. So if we strip that away, how much do we really know about a topic? Feynman, Feynman once said that if we, when we speak without jargon, it frees us from, behind it, from hiding behind knowledge that we don't have. And by forcing himself to explain things in the simplest way possible, he realized that complicated words and jargon are often a crutch, a crutch that many of us, especially in this industry, tend to use. Jargon can lead us to think that we understand something just because we know the words for it. But just because you know the word for something does not mean that you actually understand the underlying concept behind it. So by explaining things simply, we force ourselves to get to the heart of a concept. 
by being able to explain something without leaning on terminology, you very quickly realize whether or not you really understand what's going on and whether you understand the idea that you're trying to describe or whether you just know the words to help you describe it. Another benefit to explaining things the way you would to a child is that it forces us to be brief. You have to use brevity. And if you've ever hung out with children, then you probably know they don't have the longest attention spans. So you have to learn how to explain your and communicate your idea in very, very um, concise ways. Being brief pushes us also to be creative because you have to be concise but also understandable. And this is actually sometimes where words can be limiting. We can actually reach for other things in our tool belt. And Feynman realized this too. One of the things that he did was he started using drawings and diagrams to explain complex ideas simply. And the most famous of these, you might actually recognize it, is the Feynman diagram. And he used this to describe the interaction between electrons as well as particle movements. And at the time, this was pretty revolutionary in the field of science. People were kind of like raising eyebrows at his Feynman diagrams and what he was trying to do with them. But now, Feynman diagrams are probably some of the most well-known explanations for particle physics. And a quick side note, while I was re researching Feynman, I learned that um, he actually... <laughs> Hey, actually, I think my clicker just died. Oh, no. Um, that's all right. He, that's okay. Um, he actually learned that he actually um, had Feynman diagrams painted on the side of his van. Um, he had this old van that he would drive around. I think it was uh, Caltech, maybe, at the time. Um, he would drive around campus, and he would always know, like, oh, there comes Dr. Feynman in his van with his diagrams. Um, and in case you didn't know it was him, his license plate was quantum. <laughs> so that probably tells you a lot about what kind of person he was. Uh, big nerd. <laughs> but back to the Feynman technique. Once we've used simple terms to explain our concept, it's likely that we're going to realize, oh, I actually can't explain this simply without using jargon or without using long sentences. Oh, I don't actually know this topic as well as I thought I did. And that brings us to step three, identifying any gaps in our knowledge. And I think this is the most important step in the whole process because this is where the actual learning happens. When you realize what you don't know, you can actually go back and do a more focused study on that aspect of the topic. And it's pretty cool because when you strip away all of these crutches, you very clearly see what you need to learn about next in order to grow your understanding of any subject that you're studying. Once we've finally you know, filled in the gaps, we've looked at resources and blog posts, and we've figured out how to understand a concept deeply enough that we don't need jargon to explain it, well, we're ready for the last step of the Feynman technique. Taking all of our knowledge and organizing it and simplifying it into a narrative. Organizing our accumulated knowledge and simplifying it is actually the most fun part, in my opinion, because you get to take your, I, your understanding of a topic and your ideas of how you think it works and sort of create something new. You get to explain it in your own words with your own perspective. And constructing a story out of it is actually a great way to teach, too. When Feynman used this technique, he actually used simple sentences to help him achieve the goal of storytelling. He once described um, the concept of atoms and how they interact, and he did it in a single sentence. He said, all things are made of atoms, little <coughs> particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. Now, this is not a super long sentence. And if we read it again, we can actually see that it adheres to all of the steps of the Feynman technique. He's explaining very specifically one topic. And he's using 
no complex terms or jargon, really. And he's concisely telling you a story about how these characters, how these subjects, the atoms, interact. But this is actually a really complex topic that he's explaining. Like, this is probably more than one semester of physics. I don't know, someone out here probably has a degree in physics. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think it's really, it's, it's a great example of his own technique at work. And he also used analogies to help turn abstract concepts into something more con concrete by relating it to something that he knew his audience or his students would know. So it wasn't just particle physics that he explained so concisely. There's a great series of lectures from the early 80s called the Computer Heuristics Lectures. And actually, I think you can watch one of them on YouTube. Um, and in it, he uses an analogy of how a filing cabinet and a filing clerk um, is basically how a computer works. Um, and this is, keep in mind, this is early 80s, so most people are not interacting that much with computers, and very few of them actually know what they are. So he's trying to explain this new technology in a simple way. And he basically distilled it down. I think this is probably the best explanation of what a computer is ever. He called a computer a glorified, high-class, very fast, but very stupid filing system. Which, if you ever get upset with your computer, just remember. It's a glorified, high-class, very fast, but very stupid filing system. And he did this at a time when people were having, people, very few people were having, um, having the resources to understand what these new technologies were. Um, and he was kind of breaking it down for them in a really approachable way. And the final technique, I think, is you know, awesome for a lot of reasons. But I think for programmers and people in the tech industry in particular, it's really important for us to think about it and consider how we could actually use it in our industry. It forces us to test our own understanding. And it challenges our assumptions. And when I say challenge our assumptions, what I mean is not just what we think about a topic, but also what we know about it and what we think we know but don't actually know in great depth. In software and in computer science, probably the hardest hurdle to overcome is the limits and bounds of understanding what you're dealing with. In other words, Understanding the constraints of a problem are very difficult, and the same goes for learning new topics. You don't know what you don't know, and the Feynman technique sort of forces you to confront that head on. Because the Feynman technique forces you to approach your own gaps and your own knowledge, you start to see where you are more well-equipped and where you need to fill in the gaps in your knowledge. Feynman famously once said, I'm smart enough to know that I'm dumb. And I think this attitude towards learning and his technique in general is kind of the heart at what he did his whole life. His technique makes it a little bit easier for us to be self-compassionate and kind when we're learning something new because you're constantly reinforcing what you do know along the way. It's a cyclical process. Every time you find a gap in your knowledge, you go back and fill it in. And when you go back and fill it in, you realize, oh, I know this much more this time around. So you're not just feeling down about yourself because you realize, I don't know all these things. You actually see your growth along the way. And as your understanding of something broadens, you start to feel pretty good about yourself. And I think the Feynman technique is important for programmers because it teaches us how to become better explainers. It's centered around improving our own learning by including others along the way. By reframing our own mental model to teaching as a part of your own personal growth, I think we actually improve not just our understanding of a topic, but also our teaching abilities. And we can help pass that on to other people too. Feynman was known as a great explainer because while teaching any topic, he would distill it down to his simplest parts. If he couldn't explain it simply, he would start over and go more deeply into a topic. And this is 
pretty rare for academia, and I think this is still the case today. He didn't just keep his knowledge for himself in a little ivory tower up on a hill somewhere. He actually took these simple explanations and complex ideas to the masses, and he was trying to make it accessible to everyone. Some of his most well-known lectures are ones that he gave at Caltech. So at the time, he decided that he was going to teach an intro-level phys physics class for students not majoring in physics, which if you think about it for someone who's awarded a Nobel Prize and who could be just doing research and teaching advanced topics, that's a pretty amazing thing to do. And he decided that if he couldn't explain his research and his field super simply to students who did not have backgrounds in physics, then he wasn't really doing his job and he didn't really understand the things he was studying and teaching. And he actually ended up going beyond students in university. In 1964, he delivered a series of seven hour lectures on all topics in the whole realm of science. But if you watch these lectures, you'll notice he's not using complex terminology and he's not trying to make you feel like he's super smart and putting you down. Instead, he's using his own technique to explain scientific concepts to people who are sitting at home on their couch and who might think, oh, I'm not good at that, or I'm not good at science. And that's, again, a pretty phenomenal thing for someone with so much knowledge to do. He made people feel like these topics were not just understandable, but also fun. And today you can watch these videos for free and you can see the technique in action and you can still take advantage of all of his knowledge even though he's no longer here. So more than his contributions to physics and math and science, I think his life's work and his technique show us that making knowledge accessible for other people actually opens a lot of doors. His lectures started to change the way people viewed these topics. And when it was broadcast on television, a lot of people were probably inspired by watching this incredibly intelligent person share his knowledge so openly. And he kind of had a rock star reputation, similar to like Neil deGrasse Tyson does today. Um, and he kind of served as an example for his entire field. And I think we can actually use him as an example for our whole industry, because tech really needs more great explainers. If Feynman did this for physics and science, what would it look like if we did this for technology? Well, if we had more great explainers, I think we'd be making knowledge more accessible, and then we'd be opening up this industry to people who might currently think that they aren't good enough or don't know enough math and science to work in this industry. We can reach people who are traditionally underrepresented and help bring new, unique voices into the field. And through accessible resources, people who might not have computer science degrees or might not have an understanding of one tool or one technology might feel more empowered to actually try to learn. It would also mean that we'd reach people who are in the industry who want to learn something more and are struggling to find the right resources. If everyone in our field worked towards becoming a better explainer, we have a whole wide range of explanations. And you never know whom, with whom that resource and that explanation will resonate with. For example, if I had had an explanation of rate trees, I might not have spent an entire afternoon in tears trying to understand it. And hopefully, now that I've written about it, someone else out there will not ever have to go through that too. If everyone made teaching a part of the learning process, learning new concepts would be easier for so many more of us. But it's not all selfless. There are personal benefits too. First of all, learning becomes easier, I think, if you use the finding technique, and learning new things is empowering. Not only does it make you feel good about yourself, but you start to be in the loop about what's happening in the field, and you're less afraid if one day you have to learn a new tool or technology or framework or language because you know you know how to learn, so you'll figure it out. For me, learning the, the fundamentals of computer science 
through writing BCS was pretty liberated. I think I see things in a different way. I'm less afraid to dig into source code and how things work. Um, I'm more willing to try new things out, and I think I'm a better programmer for it. So how do each of us become great explainers? Well, I think the manifestation of the Feynman technique can be a lot of different things. For some of us, it might be writing a blog post, or for others, it might be adding some much needed documentation. So the next person who's trying to look up something has that resource right there available for them. Or maybe it's working with someone at your company who's newer so that you can actually explain something to them and you'll probably learn that you have something else to learn in the process. Not all of us have to record hours of lectures. You can apply this technique to so many different things and see an immediate impact. And I like to think that if all of us were great explainers and we actually tried to strive towards this, we'd see a lasting impact just like Feynman did. We might introduce new people to the field who would have never entered it, and we might retain and keep some people from the field who are kind of feeling like they want to leave it. I think if we were all great explainers, ultimately, we'd leave the industry a little bit better than when we found it. And to be honest, I don't think I can come up with a much better contribution than that. Thank you. If you're interested in learning about computer science, you can go to basecs.org. What was that? If you're basecs.org? Yeah. Basecs.org? Yeah. B-A-S-C-C-S.org. Got it. <laughs> oh, you wanted me to repeat it again? Is that what that was? I was just, I was just echoing. All right. You want to echo this, too? Um, <laughs> I'm also working on a new project this Is year. Is this, um, like, Game Boy related? Like, <laughs> Boy DS? No, it's about distributed systems. Oh. Yeah. That's harder. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm working on a new project this year, not base DS, base DS, where the DS stands for distributed system. You can go to base DS.org. Base DS.org. You know what would be great about base DS.org <laughs> is if you use this to convince other people to make the materials and then you just aggregated them, that would be true. So I should just system. buy the domains and be like, do you want to write a project yes. about this thing? Were you motivated by base CS? Now come be the distributed systems of base DS. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought it was really key that you highlighted uh, Rich Feynman using a notebook to learn things. <laughs> and then, boom, oh my god, there's blank notebooks that you got today. So I saw lots of people with those up here writing stuff down. Not Tam, but other people up here writing stuff down. And I was like, uh, what stands out? Like, why distributed systems as the second big domain to tackle? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think distributed systems is a good second step because computer science is a lot of concepts and you're kind of operate you're, you're kind of operating as though you're in a little silo. And the minute you add other machines or other people, uh, you have to throw all of that out the window because things that algorithms you would have used and assumptions you would have made with a single system, like that computer science introduces to you, that just does not work. Distributed systems. So it's it's I'm gonna I'm throwing everything I know out the window is what I'm saying. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> I'm all, I I lied and ask a second question, which okay. is um, what when you were working on the base CS project, like did you ever get the feeling of I'm just saying the same thing somebody else said? Yes, I think sometimes when people look at like technical blogging, documentation, right? It's like it's already there. They could already read about Radix on Wikipedia. So what's the point? Oh, I don't want anyone to read about Radix on Wikipedia, that's the thing. <laughs> if you're already, as you said, if you're already doctorate level expert in this topic, then I you can get a lot you of can. Yeah. Wikipedia articles. Yeah, it's just like if you, there's a couple years ago, I googled a uh, directed acyclic graph, and I went to Google Images, and I saw the first page, and I was like, ah, and I just closed the tab, I was like, I don't know what this is, so I was like, there's got to be like a, a nice intro version to that, and so like I try to add images to it, um, and I try to write about it from the concept, from the context of which I approach that concept. So you could read the Wikipedia article, um, but you don't have to. There's an options not. Um, so I already mentioned, or like, I guess I'll try this talk, this, at least what I got out of was like, you need to like, make your, when you teach things, you need to make it approachable. Like, that's the ultimate goal, to make it approachable. So did you run your blog posts by 
Like, so when or any you know, anybody who's like not familiar at all with that, just to kind of test out like how effective those posts were. Did I ever try it out on children? Not necessarily children, but like you know, just like just people who really might not be so familiar with those topics. I guess the closest is probably people who are like boot camps or people who are like I don't know, a month or two into coding, who are like, I want to learn about this computer science stuff. I've heard it's important. I don't know where to start. I like share it with them. Sometimes I feel like it's impactful. I'm sure for some people it doesn't work um, because everybody learns in a different way. So that's why I was like, oh, I'll create the podcast. And I think the podcast is way more impactful for some people because you get to do a lot more explaining and back and forth when you're having a conversation with someone. For other people, written is just like, oh, I don't want to read this post. Or some people like you know, videos because they like the visual walking through. So I think different forms are probably applicable for different people. Um, I should try try it out on people who have nothing to do with tech industry and see what happens. That's a, that's a good experiment. Uh, so when you were making these things, obviously you didn't have the things you were making. Hi, my name's Cody. Um, what else do you want to know, Jeff? I'm a developer. I'm oh, I'm not Cody. Great. <laughs> so when you're making these things, you didn't have the things you're making, and you had to presumably uh, go read Wikipedia or go read the things that were hard to look at. What was your strategy there? Um, say you live in a world where these resources don't exist yet. Um, how did you approach it? Um, so your question is, if I didn't have Wikipedia and read those resources, or what did I do when I didn't have Base, yes. The second. Yeah, okay. what did you do when you didn't have base, yes? Um, I basically would look for a whole range of resources, pick out the things I did understand from them, and what I didn't understand, I would go to another resource and see if it tried to explain it. So like with algorithms, people will talk about big O notation and you know, space-time complexity, but not everyone explains it well, so I'd be like, okay, I understand how this works. I don't know why they're talking about it. I don't understand the space-time complexity of this post. I'm going to watch this hour and a half long MIT lecture. Hopefully, they explain it here. Um, so it's just like a lot of going through many versions of people explaining different concepts. And that's kind of when I realized, oh, there's a lot of people creating resources. Not all of them, you know, make a lot of sense because it's not like you can't Google these things and find them. They're just not all going to cater to where you are. So I had to look at a lot of resources and distill it down. Hi, this is Stefania. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I wanted to build on the previous question and ask you what were role models for you in terms of um, video, blogs, podcasts, people who teach and are great explainers in the tech domain? And how was your process? Because I watch your videos and they're awesome. And you know, like I would love to learn a little bit about your experience of creating these videos, the blog posts, like how do you get better at making these explanations and these videos be so, so great? Thanks. Um, that's a great question. I have, oh, I have a lot of people that I love their resources. I'll see how many I can remember. Um, Julia Evans has a lot of great um, blog posts. She has so many, and some of them I'm just like, I don't know anything about what this topic is, and I'm still not scared to read the post because I know you're going to be make it approachable. I think Lynn Clark has amazing um, resources on, she does um, code cartoons, and she does like React and Flux, and I think she's done a recent one on Wasm, WebAssembly. Um, and I guess to answer your second question, there are a lot more, I just can't recall them right now. Those are the two <coughs> at the top of my head right now. Um, but to answer your second question, I think the more that you iterate on it, you start to understand um, what's lacking in your explanation. So for me, when I wrote the, the blog series, and then I turned each blog post into a, I'm still in the process of turning it into an episode for each podcast, and I've turned some blog posts into videos. So by the third time of going around and revisiting the same, same concept, I realized, oh, this is actually the hard part of this concept. I should spend more time on this. The first time around, I didn't know that that was gonna be the difficult part. Um, and there are other times where I'm like, oh, you should really explain this step by step because I've now gone through this concept, say for example, uh, binary search. You explain it the first time, and you explain it the second time, you explain it the third time, by the third time, you understand what problem you're going to be the questions. 
what are the easy things that you probably don't need to go over. Um, and so I think that's probably why teachers are so good at what they do um, if they've been doing it for a while because they understand the concept of the topic so well that if they've been doing it for 10 years, 20 years, they're like, all right, today's algebra, I know the hard questions, like this is what we need to spend more time on, this is what I think they'll understand quickly. Um, so I think revisiting a topic more and more will make you better at explaining that topic. And I think it'll just make you better at, at, at teaching in general the more you do it. Uh, when you look back at those early HCS uh, articles, oh, okay. yeah. is it painful you know, after like 46 later that you look back at number five or six or whatever? You go, oh, why did I do it that way? When you Mostly it's the quality of the images. I got better with the quality of the images, and so the first five, you can skip those if you want, because like I scanned them and I was like, oh my god, this is not high res. This is like, you can see the text behind it. And so that, that made me better. But How, yeah. In the beginning, like what's your the initial on? Like, let's say this eighth week or so, mm -hmm. how much time would go into one article? Uh, I would spend five, four days a week reading, um, maybe two or three hours every evening. For a second, that's more four days. No, like a couple hours every evening on the weekdays, and then I would draw, the drawings would take like four hours probably, five, because I messed up a lot, um, and then I use ink. And then I realized, oh, you can use pencil to go over it and get this much better. It's a long process. <laughs> um, and then writing it is actually not hard by the time, like if you spent a week thinking about a topic and you've, drawn, you've gone and created drawings, like the drawings help you write it. So the writing takes two hours. It's the learning about it and creating the drawings that takes six days. Yeah, so ballpark like 22 work hours to go into it. It's interesting with getting into harder or more nuanced comp like topics over the year, although your systems were faster, your topic was more difficult. Yeah. Did it stay the same like 22 hours through the year or was it actually getting longer? Uh, I think sometimes it got longer. Sometimes I would be a day or two late. Uh, what? I know. You're a was... paid blog <laughs> <day? laughs> With my free content. I was like, I'm so sorry it's not coming out. I should have posted that person on Twitter though. That was like, Nim published yesterday. <laughs> yeah, like, it threw off my whole day. How dare you? But I do think that's an interesting question because I'm working on the podcast now and Saron and I are about halfway through. And now we used to be able to record an episode in about like half an hour. And now it takes us like a full hour to go through the topic, make sure we have the algorithm correct, make sure we're not making any mistakes. And it's just like, because it is getting harder as you go throughout the series because it builds on itself, which is cool, but also draining. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.